today because I know that the number one thing on your mind is the exam. Yes, the first exam happens on Tuesday. You may wander to the lab. I will either be in the lab that we're usually in or the lab next door or the lab next door to that. And I will get you situated, not in the lab where you're doing lab, but in the lab next door to that or the lab next door to that. And you'll do your exam. At what time? Any time. If you come at 7.30 a.m., I will be wandering in with my coffee, and we will bust in and we'll get you started. Uh, if you come at 8.30 p.m., that's fine, but 9.30 p.m. rolls around, and here's what I'm doing. Ah, could you finish off? <clears throat> Please. I got to go to bed. So that's how that's going to work. I will not per se, kick you out, but I will be feeling very angsty when 9.30 p.m. rolls around. So I ask for your respect and consideration in trying to finish off by 9.30 p.m. If you know that's a problem, like you don't have a break until 9, and you thought, man, I'm going to run in there and rage it out from 9 to 9.30, it uh, might be better to plan to come at a different time and to make sure that you've gotten yourself onto my calendar for maybe the Monday before or the Wednesday afterwards. Yes, yeah, so here, here is the question. What do I need to memorize? I've gotten this one a couple of times today. What is probably the only thing you really need to memorize? The amino acid what? One letter abbreviation because on the back page, the very back page that I will give you is the same pictures of the amino acid structures that you had when we were playing the game. So no, you do not need to memorize the amino acid structures. However, getting to know them is a really good idea. Being able to look at them and say, oh, I can tell that that one's an acid. I can tell that that one's a base. Based upon the personality of what? The R group. You got it. So whatever that R group is doing, knowing what it means about that a particular amino acid. So the other concepts on the exam are very... Um, critical thought based. They're very similar to what you've been seeing in the homework. We've been doing a lot of great review uh, on that. We can review again on Friday if you would like. Um, and then on Monday, I have two formal review sessions planned. In addition, of course, to the review that's already posted under announcements. You can grab that there. On Monday, though, if you want to meet me face to face, come 2.30 to 3.30 p.m., I will be ready to go to do a review session. And then um, at night on YO courses, when we usually have our at night office hours, I'll do another exam review session. Katie. 
Right. That's such a great question. From my point of view, they're be, they'll be identical. But please remember that you are different people, and I have no doubt that when Ryan attends a review session, he's going to ask a slightly different question than David's going to ask when he attends a review session. So in no way can I guarantee that they will be identical. But my coverage that I plan to help you review with will be the same. So yeah, yep. Feel free to come to both. By no means is it necessary to come to both. Yeah, please. Yes, so the review is online. It's under announcements on YO courses. And that should have shot out to you too. If it didn't shoot out to your preferred mobile device, make sure you set your preferences in YO courses so that it does, those announcements do come to you so that you know when I'm up to something and when I'm providing you a resource or something. Okay, cool. Uh, a lot of you have asked me, is it too late to participate and follow your gut? No, it is not too late. I know that some people are waiting on the book. You know, maybe you wanted it in a particular format and you just got it. You can go ahead and still join that discussion. We have changed gears on that discussion so that now rather than asking questions, we're going in and answering one another's questions. So I will leave that open until the 20th. And then we'll move on to a new discussion. Still, by no means does it mean that you can't join during the second discussion. It just means that you couldn't possibly earn how many points? 30, right. Maybe you could earn a few less than 30, and that would be OK with you, too. So it's just up to you as to how much you want to participate. It's sort of a smorgasbord of options that you have uh, out there. Okay, wonderful. Yesterday, you learned about the gram stain in lab, and we are going to bring that into our conversation today. And in fact, that's actually what I want to start with. So in your notes, I actually want you to go ahead and flip to the page after, no, two pages after this. So kind of move on. Yeah, beautiful. And you should see a sphere. And that sphere is supposed to represent a gram-positive cell. And then on the next page after that, you should see a rod. Uh, I guess two more pages after that. You've got to zoom in on the gram-positive. And then you've got a rod that is the gram-negative. And so here's how I want to start today. I want to start in discussion. And I want to see how many of those blanks, based upon what you learned in lab yesterday, you can already fill in. So chat with one another, run up here to the front of the room and view the models if you would like. We do have some great student-made models, a gram-negative birthday cake, gram-positive, got another gram-positive here, another gram-negative. So feel free to use these if you would find them helpful, but I want you to see how many you can already fill in on there. Oh man, you're raging already, Scott. All right, I'm seeing some progress. Good, good. Good, good. And you can think, if you want to, also about what those do. I mean, not only what do they do for the bacterial cell, but also what do they do in our body? If that's a foreign invader, what do they cause our body to do? Now, I didn't say this, but there is exam bonus points for the person that gets this entirely filled in and is willing to let me show it on the doc cam. So I'm waiting for that bold, brave, incredible person. Yeah, Sean. What's that? 
Yeah, that's perfect. And then notice that this is like a zoom in on that. So this is actually really important. I'm gonna answer Sean's question for everyone. Frame 730 is like showing the whole cell. And then as you uh, flip to the next page, that's like zooming in onto the cell. So both are pictures of the gram positive. One is like looking at the whole cell, like looking at all of Norbert, right? And then the next one is like, can we zoom in right here onto a little chunk of just the cell wall and see just the cell wall? So we see that for both the gram, gram positive and the gram negative. It's thick. Yeah, that's really close. I like it. I like the term that you're coming up for it or evoking for it. Yeah. Yeah. Who feels pretty good about their gram positive labeling? Okay. It's Col Coulter, right? Yeah, Coulter's feeling pretty dang good about his gram positive labeling. Let's see if Coulter earns exam bonus points. Place your bet. All right, this is looking pretty good. First off, this is a gram positive. One of the first things that gives a gram positive away is that it has a very thick layer of peptidoglycan. Often as many as 30 sheets of peptidoglycan. This peptidoglycan, in a moment, we're going to turn our attention to covering, is a repeated polymer. And when I was talking to Hannah, I love that she tried to call it polypeptidoglycan because it is a polymer of repeating sugar derivatives, one white after the other. And so think about that and what kind of bonds might connect these uh, monomers within, within this peptidoglycan. Notice though that Coulter has also labeled lipotychoic acid. Now for full bonus points, what is the difference between lipotychoic and tychoic acid? Yeah, sweet, man, you are on today. You must have had a good night's sleep. Seriously. Okay. So lipotychoic acid is connected to the lipid. So the lipo means lipid connected. Whereas the tychoic acid is connected to one of the sugar derivatives, specifically a sugar derivative called NAM or N-acetylmeramic acid. So the connecting point is really, really different. I also love that you labeled the peripheral membrane and the integral membrane protein in the cytoplasmic membrane. So Coulter, I think this is definitely worth bonus points, so make sure that um, before you leave today, you have me write that down, okay? Or email me a reminder, okay, thank you. Sweet, did anybody get the gram negative done for us? Hold on to it. I tell you what, Hunter's kind of got a tentative hand up, so I'm going to come back to him. I want to take a moment of your time to talk about peptidoglycan, the thick layer that we see in gram positives, the structure that, if you will, is extremely protective of a gram positive cell. Against the diffusion of chemicals but instead it's protective against kind of mechanical stress or osmotic stress. Because peptidoglycan is a little bit like, if anybody else likes loose leaf tea and you put your loose leaf tea in a tea, like a tea strainer, that's a lot what peptidoglycan is like. The uh, aqueous environment can freely and rapidly diffuse across that tea strainer. However, it's incredibly mechanically rigid. So it provides this layer of rigidity. So peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. It is a rigid structure only found in bacterial cell walls. 
And by the way, I think this is working quite well today. So if anything strikes you and you want to pull it in, feel free. So this structure is going to protect against mechanical stress, and it is unique to bacteria. Now, you're probably like, why does she keep saying that? Why is that important that this is unique to bacteria? Where don't we find it? Us, right? <laughs> Good. So Carolina is right on. That's right, right. Um, that we don't find this in us. And this is really important. So keep that in the back of your mind. Provides rigidity only in bacterial cell. It is an alternating structure of these two molecules. One of these is called NAM. The other one is called NEG. And NAM and NEG repeat one after the next after the next. In our cartoon depictions of peptidoglycan, we only show the NAM and NAG repeating units as these little circles or sometimes ovals. In this model, the blue and the, you know, I guess these are like the Broncos colors, right? Uh, repeating and repeating there. Those are NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG, NAM, NAG. And that's how that structure repeats. Now, these are derivatives of monosaccharides. In fact, notice that what makes them different than the sugars that we've looked at in the past, such as glucose, is that they have some different moieties attached to them here and here, making them N-acetylmiramic acid and N-acetylglucosamine. Yeah? So the NAM and the NAG, are there going to be two NAMs like, stacked on top of each other? Or is it going to go like NAM and, and then the bottom is going to go down to the next one? Yeah, they're actually stacked on top of one another. And what our model doesn't show is that if you zoomed in really close to a NAM, you would find that there were actually four amino acids that came off of that NAM. And then there's a linkage to four other amino acids. And these are like the crocheting between the layers of NAM and NAG. So the crosslinks is sometimes the name that we give to the tetrapeptide chain that links to another tetrapeptide chain to ensure that the peptidoglycan layers are held together. Let's look in zooming closer here, but before I do that, what would be the name of the bond, the bond that holds a NAM to an egg? Yeah, because this is a carbohydrate, right? Good. So now we can look at the fact that there are also amino acids that comprise peptidoglycan in a region called the tetrapeptide chain. Now this tetrapeptide chain is made up of a few amino acids that we recognize. L-alanine is one of those. Does anybody remember what alanine looks like? Kind of amino acid or what kind of personality it has? You remember right? Isn't it just uh, um, yes. carbon and <laughs> yep, you got it. The term he's looking for, he said, isn't it just a carbon with three hydrogens? Exactly. Or aka a methyl group. So it's just a simple little amino acid. And it's an average everyday one that we see a lot of. However, most of the amino acids in the tetrapeptide chain are weird. They are so weird. They are things like diaminopamelic acid. We've never even heard of that one. It's a very unusual amino acid. And then notice that these other two, although we've heard of glutamate, they're D stereoisomers, which for those who speak chemistry will know that that's an opposite enanomer of the L. And so this is also weird. Why, if you were a bacterium with a tetrapeptide chain that knit together your peptidoglycan, might you want to comprise it of weird amino acids? What benefit might you get from having these strange linkages? Go ahead, Riley. Right, good. AKA proteases can't degrade them. So enzymes that would normally break down proteins don't really work on these tetrapeptide chains. So it's really protective to the bacterium to have weird amino acids linking together that tetrapeptide chain. 
Now, you'll notice that this tetrapeptide chain is linked to the other tetrapeptide chain, and depending on the type of organism, this linkage will be different. In gram-positive bacteria, the linkage is via 5-glycine residues. Remember, that's the amino acid with only a hydrogen R group, the tiniest amino acid. So in gram-positives, a lot of times they have what we call a pentaglycine bridge that knits together their tetrapeptide chains. In gram-negatives, a lot of times that linkage is just direct. There's just a direct peptide bond between the tetrapeptide chains. So they differ in that way. Please. <laughs> you mean like, why is, I'm not sure I'm getting your question. Uh-huh. Right, like why does it take place between this particular amino acid and the fourth one of the neighboring? Well, yeah. Like, yeah. I see that there's another cell, mm -hmm. another Like there? Yeah. You know, and I, I don't think I have a good, quite, good answer to that. It's just the, the way in which bacteria knit their tetrapeptides together. Why those two amino acids are the binding sites, uh, I, can't, I can't tell you for sure. Um, but that is how it is. Um, and it varies a little bit from one species to another where they link. And it also varies a little bit uh, as to which of the four amino acids. A lot of them are weird, right? Even in all species, most of the time they're unusual. But sometimes they vary. And actually, I want to show you a picture of that next. Because if we look at the peptidoglycan of E. coli versus the peptidoglycan of Staph aureus, you'll notice that they actually are a little bit different. We would expect Staph aureus to have the pentaglycine bridge, whereas we would expect E. coli to have the direct linkage because all staphs are what kind of bacteria? Gram-positive. Mm -hmm. All staphs and streps are gram-positive. E. coli and other enterics are gram-negative. So just a side note for helpful tidbits for the future, we generally tend to think about a lot of the bacteria that live in our nasal pharyngeal area as being gram-positive, whereas a lot of the bacteria that reside in our gut are gram-negative. That's not 100% the rule, but there are rare exceptions to it, and that tends to be the localization of those two types of bacteria. Yep, gram positive, yeah. So most, most bacteria on our skin, like good examples of skin bacteria, does anybody know one that lives on your skin? Staphylococcus epidermidis, right, lives on your epidermis, and then Micrococcus luteus, another one. If you swabbed your skin or a surface that touches your skin during lab one, you might have noticed some teeny tiny yellow colonies on the plate. Those were Micrococcus luteus. So Micrococcus, Staphylococcus are gram positives. Gram positives on the skin, nasal pharyngeal area, a lot of gram negatives down in the gut. A lot of our fecal coliforms, our fecal indicators, are gram-negative bacteria. Lovely question. Yeah. Are there no amino acids that come off the Right, correct. So the linkages are between the NAM residues, right? Good. That's very true. So the NAMs are what are knitting together the glycan chains. You got it. Very, very true. Okay. So the peptidoglycan is extremely protective, and I'm, I'm going to be in trouble here because of my miss, or my, uh, um, so please note that that word there is permeable. So peptidoglycan is permeable to many substances. Remember, it's like that tea strainer. It allows a lot of stuff in and out, so it's permeable to many substances, such as sugars, amino acids, and ions. But it's also a little bit malleable, just like that tea strainer. Like you can push on it a little bit, but it's very rigid and protective nonetheless. So we also recognize the differences between bacterial groups. We've just been discussing that and how some of them have that direct link. Some of them have that pentaglycine bridge. The pentaglycine bridge is typical of gram positives. And we also mentioned there's absolutely nothing like this in eukaryotic cells. 
So as we return back to that, Carolina, what would be a huge application of knowing that we have no peptidoglycan but bacteria do? What could we design? Help her out. Right. You got it. Anybody know of something we have already designed? Or maybe we should say nature designed it, actually, that targets peptidoglycan. Say it again. Yeah, good. Penicillin. The antibiotic, the most like iconic antibiotic is penicillin. And penicillin targets peptidoglycan. There's still disagreement about exactly how that occurs. But we know that it inhibits the enzyme that builds the tetrapeptide chains. So it inhibits the formation of peptide bonds. And that stops the cross-linking of peptidoglycan. And therefore, that effectively kills bacteria. Unless they make an enzyme that, that you know, inhibits the ability of pe penicillin to work. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's like this like layery of of you know not very protective, you know, it becomes very um you know, it's no longer immune to environmental stresses, it falls apart, right? Good. And, and becomes very subject to say ion diffusions and 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 uh cell cytoplasmic membrane um disintegration. So yeah, very, very um, targets, it, targets it very, very effectively if the cell is susceptible. So penicillin is a good example. Another really great example, though, is that our body also naturally targets um, peptidoglycan. So when you cry, if you were to isolate some of the immune factors in your tears and in other secretions, like breast milk, we would find out that one of the enzymes in there is lysozyme. And lysozyme actually breaks the glycosidic bonds between NAM and NAG. So it's like a pair of scissors just breaking up those glycosidic bonds. So it's our body's way of defending against certain foreign invaders. Yeah, it literally lyses the, the bonds between the peptidoglycan. So yeah, please, Sean. Yeah, so the tetrapeptide chain is always there. In all, um, in all cells that have peptidoglycan, which is not all, but almost all bacterial cells, there are a few bacterial cells out there that don't have a cell wall, but most of them do. Um, let me jot this down since that triggered just a, it's a great question. So bacteria, most of them have a cell wall. But there's a genus called mycoplasma. And anytime you see this term plasma, you can know that it lacks a cell wall. Who's had walking pneumonia? Yeah, not very much fun, but partly because you're still up and around trying to do things. Mycoplasma pneumoniae causes that. Pneumonia is a species name, mycoplasma is the genus name. That bacterium has no cell wall, meaning that bacterium has no peptidoglycan, no tetrapeptide chains, meaning that what antibiotic would you not prescribe? Penicillin, <laughs> right? It would be real stupid to prescribe penicillin to treat walking pneumonia. On the other hand, what antibiotic might you prescribe based on our learning last time? Or what, what structure might you target in the bacterial cell? Okay, I like that. But remember, plasmids aren't required for life. They just give a superhero power. Yeah, ribosomes, 70S ribosomes. And in fact, the Z-Pack is commonly prescribed or erythromycin, you know, something that targets the 70S ribosomes for that. So, Sean, I realize that was the long answer to your question. But most bacteria have peptidoglycan. If they have peptidoglycan, they have a tetrapeptide chain. It is the way that the, that the layers are knit together, are cross-linked. There was one other question, too. Similar question. Okay, cool. Wonderful. So uh, Tucker actually put this in his homework, which by the way, I am loving grading the homework right now. I'm taking way too long grading the homework. It's quite embarrassing. But I'm putting comments on everybody's questions. So please go back in and see the comments that I'm putting on there. But I love that Tucker asked this. How do antibiotics only manage to kill the bad germs? What's the answer there? Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, do they like select for something on the pathogen that's not there? What do you think? Yeah, totally, right? The answer is really quite dismaying. They kill everything, yeah. So all of our microbiota are also subject to um, being inhibited or killed by the antibiotic treatments that we use, which is why, what is one of the really common side effects of taking antibiotics? Say it again. Stomach upset? Absolutely. Diarrhea? Absolutely, because your microbiome's going, what? I'm, they're dying, right? They're all dying. And one other thing that tends to happen is yeast infections, because what are yeast? Eukaryotes, not bacteria. They don't have the structures that bacteria have. So when all the bacteria get killed, what do the yeast do? Party time, right? Seriously, because they're making a bunch of ethanol as they ferment away to themselves and they take over and boom, you have a yeast infection because suddenly your yeast population outnumbers your bacterial population and things are a little bit dismaying. So I love that Tucker asked that question. Thank you very much. I think we did this in pretty darn well and uh, we can say that Coulter did a, a wonderful job of layering of labeling these layers. One of the things that didn't maybe come up in, in that is what the tychoic and lipotychoic acids are made of. They're polymers. They're polymers of an alcohol and then a phosphate, and then an alcohol and then a phosphate. So what charge do the tychoic acids collectively have? Negative, boom. So this is huge, everyone. Gram-positive cells are negative. The term gram-positive means nothing about the charge that the cell has. Okay. So the negative charge comes from the polymers of alcohol and phosphate. Already we answered this question. Coulter did a great job of it. But the last thing is that tychoic and lipotychoic acids are recognized by our immune system. So in a foreign invader, those are actually seen by our body as foreign. So say that a bacterium uh, does establish residency in a place that it doesn't belong. Um, your body will be triggered in part by the high concentration of tychoic and lipotychoic acids to mount an immune response against that infection. So we might say that they are the pirate flags of the gram-positive cell. The pirate flag gives away that there's been a takeover or an invasion. Now, we can look at the actual picture that Coulter labeled, but I think you probably already got it very nicely labeled. With the thick peptidoglycan up to 30 sheets, the tychoic and lipotychoic acids. One quick note, this region right here in a gram-positive cell is occasionally also called the periplasmic space. But don't be confused. A gram positive doesn't really have a region that um, is akin to what we see in a gram negative. So now I get to pick on Hunter. I'm hopeful. Um, yes, please. Is the lipotychoic acid the reason why that space is very small because it's directly connected to the peptidoglycan? That's a great question. Um, Riley's question is, does the lipotychoic acid act in a sense to anchor the peptidoglycan and the cytoplasmic membrane? I reckon that it does. I would love for you, if you wanted to look up, to see if there is a really um, strong interaction between the peptidoglycan and the lipotychoic acid that would cause it to be an anchor. That's a great question, one I've never gotten before, so high five on that. So Hunter, you said you had a gram negative all labeled up, ready to go. Oh boy. And oh, oh, thank you, <laughs> Rockstar. Um, okay, so let's check this out and see what he's got. Serious bonus points, I reckon. Part of the reason that I wanted to do this exercise today is that the required question that everyone has to answer on the exam is you will need to draw both a gram positive and a gram negative cell wall. So getting really good at this is important. <laughs> um, I would prefer that you show me 
kind of the overarching shape of the cell that you're drawing, and then show me a zoom-in structure so that I can see your knowledge of what the cell wall itself looks like. This looks fantastic. We've got the outer membrane. We've then got the, the, the um, periplasmic space in which we have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, only around one to two sheets. So we see that thin layer of peptidoglycan. This model does a pretty good job of showing that, where you can see the purple circles in both cases are representing the peptidoglycan. Thin in a gram negative cell, very thick in a gram positive. Also, the peptidoglycan of a gram negative cell is what? More or less susceptible to penicillin? Less. Why? There's less of it. So it probably plays a less important structural role. I like that. What else? Good. It's not on the outside. And then what was coming from over here? It's harder to get to. Beautiful. So it's harder to get to. That is the outer membrane complete with its light bulb polysaccharide, high five, or AK, what do we call that for short? LPS. So LPS comprises the outer leaflet of the outer membrane. And that LPS layer is very protective. So the antibiotics like penicillin or the enzymes like lysozyme have a harder time getting to the thin peptidoglycan layer than, than they would in a gram positive where that layer is outer and exposed. Everybody feel comfortable on that? It's beautiful, beautiful. Wonderful. So um, Hunter, don't let me forget that you get a couple boin bonus points. I did want to mention too, it's interesting to note that this uh, periplasmic space is actually sometimes comprising a huge volume of the cell, like 20 to 40% of the cell will sometimes be just that periplasmic space. What could you say are some of the residents in that periplasmic space? Besides the peptidoglycan, what other action might be going on in there? Mm, those are more likely cytosolic. I like the idea. Yes, ion gradients, absolutely, right? What if this is a gram-negative cell that respires? What do we know that it would have across its cytoplasmic membrane if it respires? The ETC. Yeah, in fact, that is exactly what respiration means, is that the ETC is used to transfer electrons to pump protons to make ATP. That's what respiration is. Excellent job. So we would know a lot of ion gradients. What else would be in there in the periplasmic space? Receptors, okay, and and how about transport molecules that would take um, a solute to a receptor or to a transporter? So uh, molecules that needed to be transported, also enzymes that are needed to build peptidoglycan. Uh, so anything that might be involved in transport or synthesis in that space, love it, absolutely love it. So I want to zoom in now. Um, I want to zoom in on the outer. Uh, leaflet of the outer membrane. Hunter, did you also um, label the, the zoom in at all? That one there. Hey, but what if we do go to this, right? By the way, I love your iPad. Um, if, we, if we do go to this and you zoom in, this is the outer leaflet right there of the outer membrane. And this molecule there with the orange squares and the fuzzy long chains and the lipid area, again, what is that labeled as? LPS, or lipopolysaccharide. Now, what if we were to predict what that LPS is made of? What are the two molecules that you would guess would be in lipopolysaccharide? <laughs> Three, maybe? OK. First, lip, lipo is lipid, right? And then polysaccharide? Sugars, good. So let's zoom in onto that LPS molecule, and we'll take a look at what that LPS would expressly look like if we looked a little closer than what this depiction is. Okay. Thank you so much. So much bonus points going on today. Okay. 
So here we are, zoomed in onto LPS. And you're, you're all perfect. You're perfectly right. This is the polysaccharide region. See all of those monosaccharides all linked by glycosidic bonds and forming a large polar region, right? Because sugars like water. Man, talk about a polar head. That is a whopper of a polar head, isn't it? <laughs> it's huge. And it can be split down into several regions. This top region of the polar head is actually called the O-specific side chain or just the O-side chain. The middle region right here is called the core polysaccharide. And notice that it has a bunch of phosphate groups on it. So a, a gram-negative cell also has a negative charge. So both gram-positives and gram-negatives have a negative charge due to phosphate groups. So the O side chain, though, is really phenomenal. Um, it, is, it is recognized as the foreign invasion piece of a gram-negative molecule. It's the pirate flag of the gram-negative. So it will trigger your immune system to respond and react. And in fact, interestingly enough, if you give an animal just LPS, it will go into fever, shock. Uh, this is crazy, the impacts of this single molecule, because the body, the we, or whatever animal you give that LPS to, thinks what? It's infected. It's invaded. But in fact, it's just the LPS molecule. So it very much triggers immune function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what's the most exposed layer. So it's really those sugars. And, and Matt, what is that like if you were to pet a gram-negative cell? Oh, well, you know, what would it feel like? Fuzzy, probably slimy, slippery. And this LPS has a magical ability to stick incredible amounts of sticking. And in fact, we have a poster group. It's a Connor, right? Your poster group, was that right? Is that culture? You're in that one too, yeah? All of you guys? So that poster group wants to look at the fact that these slippery, slimy, sticky gram-negatives form a slime-encased community. What is that slime-encased community called? Biofilm, right? So cool. Biofilms are so cool because they are very strong when they are in numbers. So a lot of gram negatives all living together, making this slime and cues case community partly due to their LPS, they are able to resist all kinds of things. They're very resistant to antibiotics. They're very resistant to UV and desiccation and all kinds of environmental stresses. So the O side chain and the core, core polysaccharide are very important in, in that biofilm formation. Um, so recognized by the host defense systems, but additionally, it is this O side chain that also allows a gram negative to be a master of disguise. So if it changes the O side chain, it's kind of like, um, why do I always forget the character in X-Men that can camouflage? Mystique. Mystique. Yeah. It's totally like mystique, right? Depending on the environment, depending on the situation, change, change that O side chain, and suddenly the invader is no longer recognizable. It puts on a new mask. It changes. And therefore, it can also allow it to escape the immune defense system. This actually is the O side chain from Salmonella, and it can do that kind of thing. Down in the bottom, as you proposed, this region is called lipid A. Lipid A is embedded in the membrane. So when we think about that structure that we zoomed in on, right, the outer membrane, and we saw it being a part of the bilayer. So this, if you will, is the outer membrane, right? This is the lipid A region. Down here, this is the, the core polysaccharide. This is the O-specific side chain. So looking at that lipid, we know that sticks it down in to the membrane, stabilizes it, but it also is toxic. So together with the O-side chain, not only does LPS trigger your body to say foreign invader, 
but the lipid A also creates an endotoxic response. It's an enterotoxin. So uh, a lot of uh, toxicity from just this molecule. So remember too that the other function is allowing it to adhere to surfaces, allowing it to make biofilms, and allowing it to create this incredible permeability layer. Not only does it exclude antibiotics and toxins, but interestingly, it also includes, excludes uh, bile salts. So hang on, something should be starting to make sense. Where did we say we mostly find gram negatives? Gut. Where do we find bile salts? Gut, right? Bile salts are the detergents that degrade fats and emulsify fats in your gut. So gram negatives are like, eh, bile salts, you know, what else? <laughs> um, so Patrick. So, no, I mean, this is a wonderful, I was actually thinking to myself, is this question going to come up? Is it going to come up? We have our microbiome, right? We have all of our wonderful residents of our guts. They're beneficial to us, and they don't cause us to go into fever and shock. Why? Like, why not? Okay, a couple of things are important to that. One is balance and location. So if your, your wonderful microbiome, if you somehow got a cut in your gut that caused you to be immunocompromised, what would your suddenly wonderful microbiome be? Yeah, a terrifying disease-causing agent, right? It's balance, right? It's very much balanced health, immune function. You know, the, as Christopher mentioned, the, the balance between your immune function and your microbiome is really important. And also, if one population of cells in your microbiome suddenly started dominating all the other populations and become, became invasive, then boom, it would, right? Additionally, this is really interesting. Your body kind of does respond to your microbiome, right? And in fact, that's why we have immune tolerance. That's why if we have a good healthy microbiome, we don't have allergies because it, your body has sort of built up immunity to a lot of those recognizable characters, okay? Jake? Yeah, great. So the lipid A for the bacterium is for stability and for insertion into the membrane. It does happen to be that it's also toxic to us, though. So yeah, like, it's a virulence so factor, too, I guess you could say. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. Used, it's used it does. Uh, I guess you could say, yeah, it is one of what could be many virulence factors. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, Right, and that's kind of what I mean by immune tolerance, is that they, they actually do kind of know that they've, they've, they've touched it, right? They know, they're like, oh, okay. And it's, it's interesting, actually, because that is the reason um, that you win. So if you received a blood transfusion from um, someone, if you're A positive, right, and you receive a, a, a blood, uh, you know, transfusion from someone who's B positive, you would immediately respond to that as though it was a foreign invader. Part of the reason that you do that is because your, your microbiome has already triggered your body to see that as foreign. It doesn't take a single um, interaction. Yeah, it takes, you, you can only, like, you will have systemic agglutination and death the first time that that happens, right? It's real bad. <laughs> okay, cool. Beautiful questions. I love them. I love them. Okay. So the other thing uh, I should have uh, pointed out and maybe didn't real clearly is the lipoprotein. Now, on your pictures that happen on the next page, what is the lipoprotein? How would you label lipoprotein on that gram-negative cell that happens on the next, next picture? It's, um, it, you could call it, you could kind of call it a peripheral membrane protein. What is it linked together? What is it? It's like a safety pin that knits what two things together. Peptidoglycan and outer membrane. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we call it bronze lipoprotein. It joins those two together, kind of like a safety pin between the two. So you can label that on your picture as well. And the other thing that you see in the outer membrane is called, they are called porin proteins. And one thing that we could say is that unlike the cytoplasmic membrane, or in a gram negative, we could call it the inner membrane, Unlike that layer that's like the very exclusive bouncer at the dance club, 
the outer membrane is much more permeable, largely due to these porin proteins. These porin proteins will readily let anything that is less than about 600 to 700 Daltons in. So anybody really good with molecular weight, what kinds of things would a porin just like let swish right in? Yes, but get bigger. Glucose, but get bigger. Lactose and other disaccharides, you, they weigh in, so sucrose doesn't weigh in at 312, I think, gram per mole, so, something like that. So if 600 to 700 is the cutoff, it could let in like a four sugar, you know, molecule. It's pretty big that can come in there, but not super big, right? So if an antibiotic is super big, could it get into a gram negative cell and kill it? No, right? Because of the, the exclusion of that, that outer membrane. So let's make sure this is all labeled up. I imagine everybody has that really well labeled, but there's those porian proteins um, that exclude a little bit, but they don't exclude the same way that we see the cytoplasmic membrane being. Okay, cool. Uh, I imagine, are we getting very close? Any last question on gram positive, gram negative? Because pro again, promise, right, that you will have to draw these and you will really need to know them and help me not make it bulimic, right? Because we need to be able to come back to them and be really sexy minded about them throughout the rest of the class. Okay, have a wonderful day. You guys, really, this is the best part of my day, so thank you.